Welcome to Backyard Philosophy, a podcast where a couple friends grab some cold ones, sit around the fire, and talk about science, philosophy, and history. Crack one open, sit back, and get a good laugh as we discuss everything from automation to why the meaning of life is 42. Right now, you can go on your phone and order some food. But if I dropped you in the middle of the jungle, you'd probably die. And right now, there are hundreds of untouched tribes that have never even had toilet paper. And they can build entire towns. Which begs the question, untouched tribes, should we study them, learn from them, interact with them, or just leave them alone? But before we get into this, Nick, how are you doing and what are you drinking? I'm doing great. I'm drinking some Rogue Colossal Klaus. It's an IPA leftover from a bunch of random beers we had lying around the house. What about you? I'm doing pretty good, and I'm drinking some Buffalo Trace. Once again, it just seems to be my go-to. But Nick, this is going to be a very puzzling question for me because part of me wants to touch an untouched tribe, and part of me wants to leave them alone, and I'm not quite sure what to do. I don't think anyone's sure. I haven't heard any good answers that we came across while researching this and part of the problem lies in just all the tiny little logistics even so we'll kind of talk about why contact is difficult with these people one many of them are so deep in the jungle that it's just unlikely they'll have contact with another person we know these tribes are there either from some kind of remote sensing like a drone flying over seeing structures you know as we map out the rainforest and stuff using all sorts of things we figure them out that way or tribes that we do know are out there tell us about these other tribes that we didn't know about previously and probably the most famous tribe would be the sentinelese they're kind of around new zealand-ish and they pretty much just kill everyone who comes near them they killed some missionaries who came and they killed some sailors who got shipwrecked there and they brought people from similar tribes to try and communicate with them and because they thought they would share a similar language and they still tried to throw spears at the other native people this is kind of a tribe after my own heart because it's leave me alone and get off my property the old grumpy man in me is is come to life through this tribe and for a tribe that's never studied or learned world history it seems Not the worst thing to have a foreign agent come to your land and not want them there. It seems like uh, in history it hasn't worked out too well for other tribes and somehow they're still alive. Yeah, so one of the things that we learned historically from multiple cultures meeting is diseases spread pretty easily because there's diseases that are bacteria and viruses that we have on our skin, body, right now that we aren't affected by at all but you transfer someone transfer some of them to someone's immune system who has never seen those viruses and it could easily kill them and vice versa yeah which i think that might be a good avenue to start off with is diseases the intermingle of diseases is kind of huge it's transformed the world and for a lot of these tribes they don't have interactions with modern things if i remember correctly with christopher columbus coming to the united states or in the americas with the introduction of pigs brought swine diseases and such like that because pigs were not not native to those lands so just flooded with diseases and wiped out entire people and if we're having tribes deep in brazil the rainforest the Congo, they are not, they've not been touched by all these modern things, what we call, well, what we call modern, uh, that transfer and help our immune system. Yeah. And so right now there's people out there who are in these tribes who are even dying of potentially easy cures from our medicine. And we're going to get into it a little bit later, but is that something that we might be obligated to? to you know help them out i mean a little antibiotics could could save someone's life i mm, 
See, this is very curious to me. I that for medical treatment, I think it I think it's all context based. If a tribe member brings their child who's sick outside the tribe looking for secret help or seeking help, then we help them. But if they don't know we exist, the idea of getting involved is is really difficult. Granted, I don't want to see a person become sick and die, let alone a child become sick and die. But if we were to intervene and help them, that would change their entire society, the way they interact, their entire culture, beliefs. It's I'm not quite sure what to do with this, Nick. What about you? What do you think for diseases? I think about it like this. So if we right now, we'll say, let's just use cancer. It's a pretty broad one. If someone who was a human came down and gave us this, you know, pill that we could take and it would get rid of cancer. I mean, we would probably think that that person was like a god or something, right? Like came down in a spaceship, you know, a hel like a helicopter or whatever, like however they got there, came out of nowhere wearing completely foreign clothes. I mean, it would probably change a lot of their world viewpoint, like instantly. Oh, and if you have nothing to compare it to, like um, science fiction books, TV, all those, just kind of a blank slate on all that technology, it's, I would say, almost overwhelming. But sticking with the medical, I I'm, don't know if leaving medical supplies for them to find is also a good idea. So, like, kind of getting the best of both worlds of not touching them, but if they happen to find this medicine that you left, let them use it. That still seems intermingling. It's, it's so weird how... They're humans, and we always want to help humans, but because they're so, for lack of better words, pure, we don't want to touch them. Right? It's like, it's almost like the best thing we can do is not help them, but at the same time, now granted, there's a lot of people who we can help without even getting to these tribes. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it, it's not, like, it's it would be so easy. I mean, you could go in there... And you could probably prolong their life expectancy by 10 years at least. I feel like that's probably pretty reasonable. Oh, yes. I imagine a lot of deaths caused by uh, on these untouched tribes. Because I, I don't know about you, Nick, but I saw a very common theme where the last of the untouched tribes still in the world are all pretty much jungle slash rainforest based. I don't know if you saw the same, similar things come across your research. Yeah, that's what I saw as well very hard to get to yeah very hard to get to and for those who don't know there are a lot of creatures diseases fungi bacteria disease just a lot of things live in the jungle so i imagine the average lifespan in i don't know i'm just gonna make an educated guess say uh, a lost tribe in the brazil maybe the elders get to an age about 50 or 60 because i mean that's i mean granted that's still pretty high uh I mean, hard living, not necessarily the best diet, completely exposed to the elements kind of constantly. I mean, don't get me wrong, humans can overadapt and survive just about everything, but that's got to grind on your body and get to you. So the diseases one's really interesting to me because just a couple, couple penicillin could change the entire game. Yeah, and, and, it's, and so it's kind of like, do we just let these people, and that's the thing, it's like to help them, I guess to help their culture survive, we have to kind of let them expire from totally preventable things. And a lot of, you know, I'm just, I don't know this for sure, but I do know a lot of the reasons that people died before, you know, like modern medicine and stuff back, not before modern medicine, like before agriculture was loss of teeth. So something as simple as toothpaste you know, with that comes dental hygiene, but keep, the longer you keep your teeth, the longer you can, can eat and the longer you can live. Yeah. I just, God, I didn't even think about that or come across that. Of If you, I mean, everything's harder. If you break a bone, it, your life's going to suck and you better hope your tribe members can help you. If you lose teeth, that means your diet significantly changes for a place where you're already kind of scarce with food. I... I don't know about you, Nick, but in my mind, I don't think I've ever seen an untouched tribe or a tribe member who's fat. 
because that is that seems to be hard living in a lot of food to mouth or a lot of hand to mouth food no i i don't think so i don't think i have either it'd be pretty hard to do but if i can add on to the diseases part because this is i kind of join these together is childbirth and their death rate i i mean giving birth has always been a risky thing throughout all of time and a lot of nature a lot of animals in nature are still dying from it it's it's a dangerous thing to give birth and part of me just goes let them keep their traditions but if they have a death birth rate ratio where only one out of two children survive maybe intervene because at that time you're just throwing away human lives just to study a culture that you may or may not benefit from it seems it seems like selling our soul for the possibility of information at that point and something as simple as you know making sure the mother's getting proper medicine or even just proper food to help raise the birth and death rate i think humans might have to intervene in that situation so that makes sense only intervene if there's an issue that could cause a collapse in the society yes i i'm very happy how you worded that because i came across some articles where people were saying that we should intermingle with these untouched tribes because they're not sustainable and i'm gonna call that's bullshit right there if they were not sustainable they still wouldn't exist now granted they might fracture and probably dozens have disappeared throughout the earth without us knowing but they still wouldn't be around if they weren't somewhat sustainable granted if inbreeding becomes common maybe intervene there but uh i i agree we agree with your statement nick of if the if the untouched tribe becomes unsustainable within its own self help them live help them stay afloat yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it. Because that way, you know, we're you know, staying away. But if we'll come in and help if they really need it, like a Hail Mary, we're the last shot. We don't want the entire culture just disappear in the history books because we decided not to do anything. So what about other things that we could teach them? Obviously, you know, we talked about medicine and stuff, but what about like agriculture? would should we teach them how to farm or at that point is that just like the same as assimilation so i was happy you went to agriculture because i was heading that direction uh in my mind i kind of think of uh new guinea when colonists kind of came across new guinea and were teaching them and showing them things because uh new guinea was having kind of an overpopulation harder to feed their their people at this point and Granted, it's still hard, hard living, but because they can farm, their death ratio has gone down, which is, I mean, I'm always a big fan of less humans dying, which is weird because sometimes I, <laughs> I'm not, sometimes I hate humans, but I don't, I think if the, what I came across with agriculture, which I kind of agreed upon, was if we're slowly advancing into that untouched tribe's territory try to bring them into the fold rather than kind of isolate them or kind of shove them away because i don't know about you nick i saw a lot of tribes uh, again a lot of tribes were all kind of rainforest based but most of the untouched tribes are somewhere in the amazon rainforest from what i could tell by my research and the amazon's getting deforested more land going for lumber more land going for agriculture and that's affecting I imagine the entire ecosystem. So when untouched tribes are on the edge of someone's farm because that farm just kept advancing, I think at that point it's you have to bring them in or else they're going to get displaced and die. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, so you have, so the government of those countries is responsible for, you know, regulating the logging as, as well as trying to preserve these people. But, like you said, a lot of these people aren't found in like first world countries. There's a lot of corruption and just crime that goes on. And a lot of that deforesting of the Amazon, that's 
like people going in and stealing someone else's lumber or from the state or, or somewhere. So regulation really isn't going to solve that. So you're really going to need, you know, the government to kind of do something, you know, and not, not that they're, it doesn't seem like they're not, they're trying. I know the government of Brazil is trying to stop some of that deforestation, but at this point it's kind of like, you know, sticking your finger in a dam, you know, there's, there's not that much that you can do. So yeah, so there is some some responsibility on our end since we are causing, you know, their quote unquote habitat to, to collapse, just like, you know, all those other animals and things that live out in the woods. When you take the woods away, they still got to live somewhere or they got to die. Luckily, humans can start farming and don't just, you know, disappear. But, uh, you know, something there's <laughs> between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, that's for sure. And sticking with farming for a bit, the rainforest, I imagine, has got to be a hard place to farm because there's lots of trees kind of everywhere blocking the ground floor, so it's kind of hard to grow a crop. And I imagine you'd have to cut down kind of a patch in order to do that. And that, I mean, if you're cutting down a bunch of trees with just manual tools, that's hard to do. Granted, if done over a long time, it's easy, but that's... There's, it just seems like it's hunt. It's easier to just hunt and gather. And another big thing for me is what native species can grow in that environment that you can farm. Because this again, if we're just looking at like the Congo, India, islands, or or the rainforest, this is hard environment for plants to grow. And I don't, I don't see many plants that are native to that area surviving human farming and i want to make sure i clarify this i don't think we should ever introduce non-native plants for them to farm if we were going to teach a tribe to farm it should only be plants found in that local area yeah the tropics is out of my wheel realm um but you could bring in cattle that also seems like a very risky move but it might have to be i mean cattle needs quite a bit of land to roam and i don't think it would survive in the rainforest on if i well that's what all the all the trees are getting cut down in the amazon they're turning that ground into pasture well there there you go maybe maybe we switch them to instead of traditional farming like um like fish farms. We teach them how to do fish farms, like a rotation. Yeah. I, I think I think that's yeah, more complicated than... Uh, it's kind of like starting out playing Halo on Legendary. Like, that's... Uh, it's kind of tough. <laughs> well, listen. If, if they're able to survive in for generations deep in the Amazon rainforest with no other connection, I... Definitely wouldn't put it past them of going, hey, you do this, you get more food. I imagine their work ethic is through the roof. I can't I can't even imagine how hard of workers these people are. Yeah. Well, isn't it, uh, don't indigenous, like, I don't know what the right term would be. Hunter-gatherer societies only need to work about four hours a day. They are much better hunters than I am, that's for sure, then. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think so, but <laughs> then, then probably most of us, most of anybody, um, when it's when it's your life on the line, you got to get good. And when you do something for you know thousands of hours, you get good at it. You know, when you do something for like most hunters, yeah, probably the average American hunter maybe maybe hunts for fifteen days a year. You know, a lot of people only go out for like a single season, maybe a week or so. Some people will be hunting, you know, pretty much year round. But 15 days a year is, I would guess, an average. That's not enough time to really, you know, know everything. But if you're out there for four hours a day, most days of your life, yeah, you're going to get pretty good at it, I imagine. Yeah, born into it. I know for some ancient tribes, I imagine it's the St. Virginia's tribe where the parents would hunt the bigger game and the kids would try to hunt smaller game. So if the parents went out to hunt some birds, the kids would try to hunt lizards. So at least they always have some type of meal at the fire. 
Interesting. Yeah, you're like you said, it's it's a from birth your entire life. And, you know, it's not just hunting, you know, I'm sure they there's it's the rainforest. There's a lot of plants. I'm sure there's a bunch of plants to eat, insects as well. It's more of knowing how to get food or where what what you can and can't eat than anything. Um What about farming insects or smaller game? I imagine there's got to be snakes that you can farm or giant centipedes you can farm or i don't know ant colonies you can farm well the problem with that is i think all those animals are territorial like ants will fight other ants unless it's the same like uh i don't know colony i think is the word well i mean all right let's just look at so you um, can't like keep them contained because they just kill each other Okay, well then let's look at just snakes then. Obviously, if it's a wild snake in the Amazon rainforest, I'm going to assume it is pissed off at me, dangerous, and doesn't want to be tamed. But I would say that's the same for every agricultural animal that now exists today. It's just selective breeding, and you just continuously do it. Like, I, I know there are some tribes, and I believe it's Central America, they keep hamsters or whatever is native to that area. It might not be hands. It might be guinea pigs. It's probably guinea pigs. They keep guinea pigs alive in their huts because the guinea pigs will help them notify if jaguars are nearby. So if we're able to do that, I mean, you, if we could turn wolves into pugs, why can't we turn guinea pigs into the size of a llama? Yeah, we can just use llamas, right? They're somewhere down there, I think. Not the rainforest, but um, yeah. I think alpacas do that too. If you put a alpaca out with like a bunch of goats and stuff, it'll fight off like cougars and stuff. It's pretty cool. Did not. I think you told me that, but I didn't. I still don't remember that. You and cougars, you have an interesting problem, Nick. Yeah, probably a similar problem to these people. So getting getting big cats to leave me alone. So I'm sure those predators are trying to, uh, you know, also putting a dent in their prey. What if we... What, all right, so let, let me give you a hypothetical. This might be a little bit off topic, but I, I think it's kind of interesting with medicine and food. What if we had a tribe that was slowly either losing its territory or kind of is forced to interact with humans? But what happens if we were able to start off by doing trade with them? So we seem less foreign. Because I feel like trade is very universal. I give you something, you give me something in return. So we could trade like their native plants for medicine. Or, I don't know, uh, exotic animals that they catch for food. How would how do you feel about if we are forced to interact with them? Our first interactions is first trying to figure out trade. Rather than try to teach them something. Rather, whether it be agriculture or rather just full-on give something where they become dependent on us kind of have their independency still but still help them yeah i think that's the way to do it i mean you could even what you'd probably start out doing because you're trying to are you trying to just uh i guess is your objective to slowly bring them into the fold of society or to provide them with something that will help them with their stay as independent as they can but help them what out of whatever situation they're in I guess my self-conscious is going, there are people who need help. We should help them. But at the same time, I want to keep them... For some reason, I don't know why there's a stigma of our current culture being unpure and like untouched tribes being pure. Because untouched tribes will come across another tribe and just wreck them. Just slaughter them all. Like There are definitely tribes that do that. So this the whole unpure, pure thing, I have no idea where it comes from in psychology. And it's definitely affected me but i feel like that's the best of both worlds where i can still help someone but i still don't take away their independence it's all I, for lack of better words it's like it's like interacting with your grandparents where they can't help you do all the things but they can help you with something and it helps them feel more useful it helps them interact helps them contribute it it kind of gives me that feeling trading with an with a newly discovered or newly contacted tribe yeah, because I was thinking, so like, if we're just trying to give them something like some medicine or something, you could trade that because a lot of these tribes have 
tribes that we are in contact with that will interact with that tribe as well. So you'd have to kind of trust them, but you could give that trade them something, trade them something to trade to the uncontacted tribe. But yeah, because even I mean, a lot of these, like you said, like it's it is like a it's like a first contact, you know, like how do you initiate a first contact? I mean, first off, language barrier. So you're going to have to find someone maybe like like we said, another tribe that we do have contact with to act as a translator and then. I mean, to explain what's going on, like, how do you explain, like, hey, there's some people who are, you know, just bulldozing all the... Might be different looking, might different colors, might be have different clothes, might might have, like, shaking, uh, something as simple as shaking someone's hand might mean something completely different in their, tri- in their tribe. Not to mention the bacteria on your hand might, might end up killing them, and, may, and maybe the other way around, too. <laughs> I mean, you'd have to have, you know, your six foot distancing. Nick, don't say that. That makes me sad. Um, I know. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd be telling them something that's completely like out of their realm of understanding, possibly. Like we talked about with the rainforest being, you know, cut down and turned into cattle grounds and just by, by criminals. Um, I mean, how do you explain there's this giant metal contraption that's just, you know, cutting down logs. Breathing black smoke and having a weird roaring noise. And it's going to cut, it's going get, to get rid of all this land around your village, so you're going to have to move. Like, obviously, the easiest thing to do would, you know, be to stop that habitat from getting destroyed, but they've been, I don't know, quote-unquote trying? <laughs> uh, I don't know how this what the state of that exactly is but it doesn't seem like it's working so do we as a society say hey this might be a this might be a a rainforest issue (laughs) more than a uncontacted tribe issue so it, it really seems like it'd be easier just to stop stop the cutting but to do that so the reason they're doing that is because there's no jobs available anywhere else and so that's the only way they can make money and people are going to you know provide for their families over starving i guess so for, then you have to figure out why there's no jobs in brazil which is getting way off topic i guess yeah i but here's a hypothetical situation about trade mike so say you're going to trade we're going to trade we've established that this is a good idea hypothetically and you're going to trade them some antibiotics to treat a disease that's running around their village and we offer them the antibiotics as a, you know, we'd, we'd like to give it to them, but as a gesture, they, uh, you know, they have to give us a gift too, because that's how humans work. What happens when they offer us like a person, like a slave? Maybe. All right. Stay with me. This is kind of long winded. Maybe we take them and tell them that they'll be ours. But in fact, we take them into our world and we teach them our culture and that's the bridge when we bring them back in between both so they're kind of like the astronaut for their tribe meeting aliens where they're the ones going out they're the ones learning seeing the world coming back and then telling their tribe about it because it's easy I, i again it's i can't imagine what it feels like to not know the knowledge we know Imagine all you knew were the trees and animals around you, nothing else. Not that people look different, not that there are all these different animals, not that you might not even know an ocean exists. Uh, not you might not even know snow or ice exists. You might not know all these things, and then you get introduced to these world one, they might get shell shocked. But if they're able to overcome that and come back, that might be a great catalyst to help that tribe get introduced into quote-unquote modern society yeah that is an oddly specific answer to my question (laughs) what do you think we should do then nick no i don't know (laughs) i I don't (laughs) know it's more a question of more i guess morality of after reading about some some of these tribes and listening to how people talk about them when tribes that are uncontacted like this or even that we know about practice things that are 
obviously bad, like from our society's viewpoint, we give them a pass. Like there's tribes that eat people, you know, and differ not out of, uh, you know, hatred, but because they believe when they start acting like this way, if they're a witch, uh, kind of paraphrasing here, that they're uh, a, a devil or, of some kind, that the only way to remove the devil from the tribe is to eat that person. And everyone's just like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, that's what you do. And it's like... It's standard in their culture, but not ours. Right. And so, but, so there's that. And then you got like, you know, I'm sure some of these tribes still go out, like you said, get in fights with other tribes. It's like, it seems to me that we give them, we don't judge them by our moral system. We judge them by how they can do no wrong system. Like if, if, uh, you know, someone in Russia went and ate a bunch of people, <laughs> we'd be like, oh, well, he's a bad guy. But if they do it in this culture, it's like, well, that's that's just their culture. And it's not a perfect example because I'm 90% sure, well, most, unless things get really bad in Russia, which they often do, <laughs> they don't eat people. <laughs> Nick, I was going to say, if it's a Russian eating a bunch of people, that's not a Russian. That's just a polar bear with a hat. Aren't all Russians just polar bears? <laughs> that was, yeah. <laughs> all right. So, but what, like, another big thing for me, too, for something I think is wrong, but for some, again, we turn, like you said, Nick, turn a blind eye to, is these tribes are small in population. They don't have enough people to have a large gene pool. So I imagine when they come to another tribe and they see other women, they either trade for the women, kill the other tribe and take the women, or just rape the women to just, you know, get the more genetics, to get more bloodline to in. It's kind of what all human ancestors did until quite recently. And that's horrible and wrong, but because it's such a untouched tribe, it's almost like an ancient... It almost like a... It, for lack of better words, in lack of better description, like a child, like oh, they're just, they're just uncultured. They're just children. They're that's just the way it was back in the time, and it's just the way in that it's just so weird. I don't, I, I feel like there's a special German word for this that I do not know. Oh, uh, there, there definitely is a special German word for this. I don't know it either, but no, it, it, it is like that though because you start making. Like, oh, well, you know, they're just not part of our society, so they don't know that's wrong. But we judge other societies for doing things that we think are wrong as long as they're somewhat in our world. Like, you know, North Korea, they do a lot of terrible things, but that's just their society. So is that OK? And that's a not probably not the best comparison, but it's like, where do we draw the line of different and similar? Yeah, like, let me give you a hypothetical, Nick. You have a tribe that you're observing from afar with a telescope, drone, whatever. And you see a tribe, meet another tribe, and that tribe kills people. I imagine, Nick, and I I, I want you to answer this, that you, you go, well, that's just kind of the situation. It's rival tribe versus rival tribe. Am I correct in the th this thinking of that's how you would think? Yeah. Okay. Now adding on to that. I mean, that's how it's been for thousands of years. Yeah. That's how it still is today, even in the f civilized world. New skin, different name. I completely agree with you. But now, say, going back to this being possessed situation, in the tribe, it's a child, and you're watching. I don't know if I could idly stand by and watch a child get killed because the tribe has the lack of knowledge of knowing what's wrong with a child, whether it be some type of disease. Or like how the Spartans used to throw their sick and unhealthy babies off a cliffside I don't know if I could stand aside and watch that happen if that was happening in modern society where I was viewing it through a camera and I had the means to change that. I don't know if I could st just stand there and watch them kill a child who might get who might have malaria and they just don't know what malaria is. They just think it's that child is possessed so they need to kill him. Would you, what would you do in that situation? I mean, I'd hope I'd try and help somehow. But yeah, I, I mean... It's weird because, and so this kind of, okay, so I, there's a point that you touched up that I wanted to hit upon that I 
kind of made me think about something. So these tribes that are contacted or uncontacted, they have to interact with other people to maintain some kind of genetic diversity to survive, whether that be through trade or warfare, they need to change the gene pool. And so, yeah, I, I want to, this might be jumping way far ahead, but I want to, I came up with a dumb idea that I call opera. Oh God, what? I had a really funny name. It was like operation Toucan or something like that, where you do kind of quote unquote random acts of God where you don't intervene, but say they're, about to murk a kid because he's sick and they don't understand why. Well, you have a loud speaker hidden somewhere, and you just blast a really loud note and kind of throw them off their game. Or they're, I don't know, about to... I, I Well, I can't use it for the rival tribes because I agree with you, Nick, that we shouldn't probably intervene if we're going to not mess with their gene pool. But our... I, I, I don't know, for some reason kind of conditioning and training like if we're invading their land through deforestation bulldozers and they start doing something that's probably gonna get them killed like interacting with say the first time they accidentally discover a firearm and they're playing with it we should probably stop that but if we want to keep them independent we shouldn't just run in there and go no 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 like this person that they don't understand that dresses really differently waving their hands frantically yelling at them it's probably not going to go over well but if we add like a, a jaguar roar in the distance, they might kind of quit matata. Just might kind of have no worries. Don't worry about it. We're just going to put this item down and we're going to leave. That's just what we're doing. Kind of that conditioning to get an intermingle between both worlds. Yeah. I mean, so it's essentially intervention through non-intervention. It's, a, it's a, yes. just a, it's a really slow assimilation to our culture. Well, I think I think that's eventually what's going to happen to all tribes. I think we're going to discover eventually every corner of this earth, and there's going to be nowhere else for humans to hide. Yeah, I mean it's it is. I know we talked about it at the beginning, but it is crazy that right now we're talking to each other across a country, and there's people who, like you said, never use toilet paper, never seen a cell phone, never heard of like a TV. I mean, I have ice in my glass right now. <laughs> like, could you just try trying to imagine? Like, yeah, I go, I go to this silver box, and I hit this button, and fresh, clean, frozen water comes out. I mean, we have clean drinking water coming out of multiple places in just our dwelling, not for the town, just just our house. It 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 is insane. Oh, it is insane, and. If we were to show an untouched tribe this, do you think they would want that? Or do you think we'd be fooling them? Or do you think they wouldn't like our culture at all and try to revert back to theirs? Okay, so glad you brought that up. So when, I forget exactly when, but kind of the you know beginning of the, I want to say, 20th century, anthropologists went and lived with a lot of you know tribes that Maybe they had seen, you know, I guess what you call quote unquote civilized people before, like modern for that time people, uh, but probably not like regularly interacted with them. And what they found is that these societies were drastically happier. Now, I'm kind of thinking that might be, I don't know if that was like a thrown off because, I mean, imagine if like some alien came to you and just started giving you a bunch of free shit you'd be like this is awesome this is like the best day and he spent like a week with you it'd all be pretty exciting wouldn't it oh absolutely but what they did find all over is that these societies tended to be they thought that they were happier than modern societies so we could bring them we could give them all these great things that we have but would they be happier i mean the little science we have says that people are happier living like that. I agree with that, that people are, for the most part, happier with that. But I think there are different levels of happiness. I imagine, I, I, Nick, you, me and you both can testify this, after a hard day's work and you have some cold water when, you, when you're so thirsty, your lips are dry, that water, oh my God, it's so good. It's, it's so tasty. It's 
the best thing in the world, you're happy. When you have... I'll one-up you a cold Gatorade. I'm allergic. No, awkward. Moving on. Not some some quality H2O. So, so, that's, that's that's Gatorade. Gatorade. I'm going way off topic. I, I love Adam Sandler movies. But I imagine it's because your quality of life isn't that high that every little thing seems like a blessing, which is a good thing. We should, we definitely, and I would say modern culture take things way too for granted, way too things for, take things for granted, and having the hardship in your life makes it, you appreciate the things more. But if you're barely scraping tooth and nail, you don't really get to have the full level of happiness. Uh, it's, if your life sucks, little things make you happy. If your life's pretty good, it takes big things to make you happy. If your life's full of everything you could ever want, stuff like that, that gets boring because there's no, there's no comparison. Like you can't have good without evil. You can't have evil without good. So I think it's a little bit of a mixture. Yes, they're happier, but I don't think their level of happiness is higher than the level of a person who's happy in modern culture. I think that's a really good point, Mike. I that uh yeah generally they're happier but the heights you know it's kind of like maybe it's how people say you know the way you look at the world before and after kids where before kids your emotional range is like a plus five to negative five but after kids your emotional range is like a plus 10 to negative 10 might be like the same thing yeah and i imagine also the lows have got to be much lower than i'm curious about the lows because if i say i get in a car accident and i get some bones broken that would mean death in some areas so that would be everyone would mourn for me everyone would be sad be like yeah i'm i'm dead i'm it's my life's gonna suck i'm gonna get face a painful death and then die but if that happens i don't know going to work i'm probably be fine and what's gonna take the hospital patch me up yeah the medical bills are gonna suck but I'm not scared of morality or death of the simple things. It kind of, I think that's a good thing and a bad thing. And I'm not quite sure where I stand with it with a tribe. It's like an untouched tribe that doesn't have medicine or something like that. They might have their own methods, but if something bad happens to them, that's just kind of it. And I imagine the whole tribe's got to be very kind of sad. And that those, I mean, if you're that small, if you're a small tribe, Everyone's going to be tight-knit. Everyone's going to be friends. Everyone's going to know... I mean, you have to know each other. Everyone's going to be like a one big family. So imagine every time someone dies, you lose a family member. And if your lifespan isn't that long, you're losing family members more often. Your lows have got to be really low. Like, you have no really support base. Or maybe because everyone's mourning with you, your support base is better. I'm not quite sure. I don't know. I'm kind of rambling on here, Nick. No, you're good. I, I think... It wouldn't affect them as much. I think death is a much more common part of their life than it is our life. Ooh, I like that. I didn't think about that. And so the other thing is maybe they're they're happier for their life, but say their lifespans, let's say like average 37 years. I feel like that's a good wild guess. Does being happier for 37 years, is that better? And this is just a completely hypothetical question being better than happier for what's the average lifespan like 69 years in the united states it's all right i think it's 79 for males 82 for females oh, geez. yeah i was way off but uh yeah i mean how do you how do you decide quantity versus quality but i would make the county argument that you have the you have more opportunity in modern culture than an untouched tribe to have a better quality life so you have the potential for a higher quality of life, but with an untouched tribe where it's kind of that s traditional bonfire lifestyle, you have a higher chance of quality. I would say that those are how the odds work off in my head. Yeah, I don't know. No, I mean, I think it's tough. It's tough to say. I mean, and that's not a decision that it's a decision that I think it'd be better if they could make for themselves. But how do you? But to even broach the subject, you'd already have to make part of that decision for them you know break that fourth wall well kind of adding on to that and kind of going back to the beginning a little bit 
I want to ask you, Nick, before I answer this question, why do you think we want to observe untouched tribes? So I think we want to learn from them. So like I said, not only their just genetic code, but how they interact can and how they live their life, how many hours a day they go hunting, how many hours a day they go fishing. I mean, hypothetically, would I go to that kind of life if I could fish for eight hours a day? I don't know. It's it's tempting. But uh But Nick, no beer. No, most people most uncontacted tribes have some form of alcohol that they brew. Never mind, I stand corrected. But yeah, no whiskey though. Ooh. Man, trade offs. Um but uh yeah, I mean we want to learn from them just as much as they want to learn from us. And then one thing that I found out that was I thought pretty surprising the people who really want to get into those uncontacted tribes are uh, like medicine companies because they want to know what medicine they've been using. That's jumping a little far ahead. I want to come back to medicine, but I want to, I want to, I, so what do you think that we're, why do we want to interact with them so much? Well, before I get to that, I want to, you, you made me think of something that I want to, I want to touch on is we want to learn how all these tribes have their day to day life. But if all these tribes are living in similar areas, now granted, Amazon rainforest is huge, so similar areas is kind of a broad statement. But let's just say there are two, and uh, this is complete out of my ass. Take this with a grain of salt. Two untouched tribes within a hundred miles of each other. I imagine they're going to have pretty similar lifestyles. So why do we have to untouch both of them? Why do we have to observe both of them equally? Why, why can't we just observe one? And transfer the knowledge to others do we need that big of a study group and what i think we do is simply because we want to see what humans look like without technology as much as the internet google electricity has all i think overall benefited society i think humans long and romanticized a day of past where we didn't have technology and I think our romanticism for that wants us to preserve, again, that purity, that that golden age of human history of we were hunters and gatherers around the bonfire telling stories and just that kind of that kind of romance of uh, of our ancestors we want to preserve. But I think nostalgia is kind of dangerous, and I don't know if nostalgia is necessarily the right reason to do this but i would say that's the main reason we do it is one to study to learn which i would argue we could learn more if we interacted with them and they taught us this uh, their their methods their ways than just simply learning from afar but i think the main reason comes down to nostalgia yeah I, I think you're right and so i guess one of the question i guess one of the answers would be you know right now so why do we have to see what they're all doing we could just look at a few you know, better sample size never hurt. But uh, so I think that's part of it. But I mean, it, it, this is one of those da this damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? <laughs> because okay, so say we go in and we help these people live live a longer life. However, we do it, and then people say, "Oh man, like you went and just completely destroyed these people's cultures." If you don't do anything, and these people die of completely preventable diseases, it's like. How can you let these people die? Some of you are living in million dollar homes and there's people dying of, you know, the flu, like something completely preventable or people dying in, in childbirth when they don't need to. I mean, it's like either way, like you're there's there's really no winning here. It's more just a fun moral game, I guess, because I mean, the easy I mean, it's almost easier. You know, the easiest path is often the wrong one, but it's almost easier to just ignore the problem and let it go away because <laughs> you, you can't win with this. Yeah. I don't, I don't think you can win this, but I don't know if there's a way to lose in this either. I think it's, it's just a trade off. But I mean, I think losing might be not interacting with them or you're just studying them in some way of seeing how humans who live like that actually live like, legitimately live and to try to do it as non-invasively as we can because like i said some scientists go and bring in a bunch of gifts introducing himself and then saying wow all these people are really happy you know bring a case of beer to my house and you'll get the same reaction 
But, you know, when we go and study them, then we know more about where we came from and just how we lived. But is it right to just use them as like, a, you know, guinea pigs, essentially? Nick, that is perfect into my transition of what you mentioned a little bit earlier with medicine. I think another major reason why we don't want to interact with these untouched tribes is greed. We are using them as lab rats of figuring out what works, what doesn't work, what the human body is capable of, what the human body is not capable of, like experimentation through observation. And with medicine, what did they use and what plant is that so we could grab that and maybe use it somewhere else? I Guinea pigs and greed seem to be a part that could be a major part of why we don't want to interact with untouched tribes granted our hearts might be in the right place of wanting to keep them their own society but there's always a bigger game of foot well yeah oftentimes if your heart's in the right place it might not be the best course of action it seems like with humans i, mean, I don't know how many times we've done something because our heart's in the right place but it didn't work out yeah but i again i see you know someone again i would I'm very curious on the psychology of a person who wants to meet or the psychology of the person who does meet untouched tribes. Like you got to be the coolest, most relaxed person ever able to read all the body languages. And to do that is crazy. I imagine their hearts in the right place, but like a company or an expedition that's funding that might be like, Hey, if you see what plant they're using, let us know, you know, can't, I mean, can't, can't hurt. We might get more medicine. Might, hey, you might help save more lives. Or just like with an untouched tribe of, hey, they're in this condition with this parasite. How does the human body react? Or they're in this climate and they need to do this and this to survive. Okay, so we can use this for this technology. Okay, they're using these tools to cut down this tree so we can make this more efficient it might it really does seem like they might be able to reverse engineer a untouched tribe to make modern technology better so it might be agreed i don't know it's just an idea that i had yeah i mean obviously we have to find indiana jones because he's the perfect candidate to do that dr jones or, uh, Oh my gosh, what's the guy, Bodhi? The other guy speaks 11 different languages, can blend in everywhere. <laughs> Got lost in his own museum. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's always going to be that with, with, I mean, I feel like there's always going to be that with everything. You can do good, but someone's trying to benefit, and so we're just trying to steer clear of that whole situation so we don't be, we're not the people. We don't get the blame. Who get involved in that. We don't get the blame, yeah. Nick, let me ask you another hypothetical. Mm -hmm. You have an untouched tribe, right? They have some root that they grind up and brew into a tea and drink that helps them with a certain disease that is plaguing majority of the earth in order to, well, not, not plaguing, but perhaps affecting large people. It's, not, it's a non-lethal disease, but it makes a lot of people's lives discomfortable. Would you go in and kind of touch this untouched tribe and kind of break that barrier in order to help millions of other people be non-uncomfortable. It won't save their lives. This is a non-deadly disease, but it's, an, it's a disease that makes us uncomfortable. Is that justified to break the barrier of an untouched tribe? When, one, when does one life matter compared to the lives of thousands, I guess, is kind of the question I'm asking. Yeah, that's a good question. This is exactly why I don't want to be a politician, so I don't have to make hard decisions like this. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, man, it's a good question. Um, it's it's tough because you're not saving a life, right? You're preventing discomfort. Yeah, like, uh, say, like, um, arthritis. Ooh, they have man, a root. Yeah, that would be, that's a tough one because that's, you're just improving quality of life, you know? And you, and so does changing these people's lives forever justify the just offset justify it? Man, I mean, honestly, I I probably would for arthritis. Yeah, I probably would too. <laughs> because f for arthritis, because people it, it shuts people's lives down prematurely, right? Like 
you can't do all the things that you used to do. So you still get to live, but you can't operate like you used to. You can't go out and do all the stuff you used to do. So it shuts your life down earlier than you you thought. You're still alive, but your quality of life isn't as good. So I, I think I would, but I wouldn't want to be the guy who makes <laughs> that decision because because what if it what if you think it is and you go in there and it's not and then you just you fucked it all up and now you, see here's the thing like if you did that and you did cure arthritis you'd be a hero if you did that and you didn't cure arthritis you'd be public enemy <laughs> number one. Yeah, damned if you do, damned if you don't again. So, I don't know if you came across this in your research, but because I didn't think about looking it up until now, but is there an organization that gets to decide who goes to intermingle with an untouched tribe? Or is that like a country-based? Or I don't know the rules and ethics. Oh, not the ethics. The, the rules of engagement for an outsider meeting an untouched tribe. I was wondering if you came across it at all. Um, so I as I understand it, it's each country has their own rules about it, but there's a lot of uh like charities who kind of do things to help uncontacted tribes. Like I came across this one, it's called like Survival International a lot, and uh they you know, do stuff to kind of make it so that it's basically keep people from contacting these people um but i but i don't know it's not like an official one it's just like a a third party i think most of the time it's the government has a lot to do with it like i know in india and uh what's the other one there's another one that they kind of patrol that but they don't always do the best job so that's where these third parties come in okay so that they're kind of setting the barrier but i'd be curious nick if you're if you are being sent in or you're sending someone else in, how would you tell them to treat the situation? And I'll be honest, for me, I probably have a sniper somewhere in the trees for that person or myself. You're like, hey, if they decide just to kill me, mark them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's a, <laughs> a little dark, but kind of true. Yeah, there. that's like uh, there's... The, the tribe in India, I think it's the the Jarawa. I have no idea how to say that. Is that the one in Sri Lanka? Uh, it's on an island. Yeah, I believe that's the one. Okay. Um, is that the one where they killed the the, uh, the poachers priest? Oh, I'm thinking about like the, different the different P. Them. No, that's the Sentinelese. Ah. ah, it's a it's amazing how many times the untouched tribes kill religious people. I find it. I feel like there's a joke somewhere that should need to be written. Um, no, but no, these guys, they're like pretty peaceful. Like there's a road that they, India built through their land and they'll come up and people will like, essentially it's like a safari, but it's like, you're not allowed to take pictures, you know, but everyone does. And you're not supposed to be doing it like to go and see these people, but obviously everyone does, but they'll come up and like, they're not killing anyone. But then these poachers came and they were killing these hogs that they hunted, and these poachers killed a bunch of these hogs, so they had to switch to deer, which they had never eaten deer. And that's something that I think is crazy, that, well, one, like, you live in the woods and they've never eaten deer that are plentiful, but just the, it seems, a lot of these, their diet seems pretty static, like, they eat the same thing over and over again, you know, like, not that it's, necessarily the same meal but they eat pig with like every meal which is kind of foreign to us but and they just killed them and they were talking to this guy they're like yeah these these people were killing the pigs so we killed them all and it was just like nothing like he's like like you it, you just said it like it wasn't even a thing you know like he I'll be honest. didn't even care and i was like oh man that's right because these people are used to you know fighting to survive killing another person isn't like it's the way we don't look at it the same way here honestly i was kind of on the side of the un, like the untouched tribe there i didn't bet i'm like well yeah you're you're fucking with my food that's gonna go on my family's plate i no hesitation you're you're my territory and you're eating my food fuck off well i was more like man i feel like now the government like i, I wouldn't <laughs> they don't know not to admit to a crime on camera, Mike. That was 
<laughs> oh yeah, I forget about that. I forget there's this thing called laws. But yeah, so it's just like, yeah, I mean, all these tribes who are peaceful, you're just one mistake away. Now, granted, not saying we should go and kill all their pigs and be like, why did you kill me? But, I mean, you never know. <laughs> if you poke a hornet's nest, you don't ask the hornets why he got stung. Yeah, I don't know. It's almost like every untouched tribe is a case-by-case -case scenario. There's no really good answer because some tribes are like, you know what? You seem cool. We'll interact with you. Other tribes were, well, when you send a, a priest to try to convert them into your religion, they just murk you. Maybe kind of leave them alone, but also I kind of get it. No one likes solicitors. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, that was just a bad joke. I, I couldn't resist. I appreciate that, though. Put them on the old it do is... not call list. All these different methods that they have, again, I don't see them being that different. And I see us learning more and for interacting with them rather than just watching them. But again, I it just depends on the tribe. Some tribes would probably be eager to have help. Other tribes would be like, I don't know what you are. We're going to just mark you or we're just going to run away or we're just never going to avoid you. Which also begs the question, Nick. I don't know about you but i saw for some of my um untouched tribes they tend to be more semi nomadic where they kind of have an area they wander in but they don't necessarily stay in one spot all year round is that something similar to the tribes you saw yeah yeah i think that's similar because i think if you're at that point of where you're staying in one spot you're like working up to you know agriculture and at that point, meeting another tribe, like, because most of these tribes, not all of them, but most of them may have had contact with the tribe who does have contact with us. So I feel like by that, like, there might be some, like, more willing to, to know about us. And another thing that uh, these people say is that these tribes who are uncontacted, they d it's not that they don't know about us. Like, they don't know that there's uh, other people out there who have crazy technology they just don't interact with they them. just don't interact with us so yeah i don't know <laughs> I, I i am very curious though it we've talked about it before in other podcasts we definitely go check out backyard philosophy or anywhere you listen to podcasts of we as humans occasionally in our genes get the itch the urge to explore to find new lands and i'm wondering if that happens the same with these isolated tribes like uh this is kind of a poor analogy like when the amish when they send their children out and they do rumple spring can never rum spring yeah that that of that and a lot of them well not a lot of them a good portion of them don't come back because they enjoy kind of and fall in love with the world and others go back because they miss it and it's kind of overwhelming i'm wondering if that happens with untouched tribes now, granted, the population is probably way less, so to have a someone in your tribe that wants to be an explorer, who wants to climb the highest trees, who wants to venture beyond the known territory, that's got to be rare, but I imagine that's got to happen. Now, granted, it's kind of hard to trek through the jungle. Moving through all those plant lives sucks, and it's so hard, and it's so much physical work, so I imagine that's a great deterrent. But right, Nick, there's got to be some tribe members who want to explore who will eventually or have run into outsiders. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that I guess this is my now it's a relatively small population. So maybe one, let's say maybe 10 percent a year would like to go out and explore. But it's not like Rumspringa where you can just, you know. You're within walking distance of, of this stuff or or a car ride or something. Like this is like you said, a trek. So even if you want to it, how many what percent do you think would hike through the jungle? I mean, some of these people are way out there. And then what what you're getting to probably an, so another tribe and then maybe like some, you know, logging camp or something. It's not like you're going to walk to a major metropolitan area and then you don't have money. You don't speak the language. I mean, it's got to be like, that's just, that'd be such an incredible journey. I wonder if anyone's done it. 
I mean, I'm sure. I feel like we would I, know if someone has, right? I imagine someone has. I. Well, that's probably how untouched tribes become no longer untouched tribe. Someone in their own tribe goes out, finds some loggers, going like, "Hey, there are some weird motherfuckers out there wearing all these weird clothes. We should inter. We should go talk with them and mingle with them, and then that kind of builds from there. And yes, I, I would say the chances are kind of low because God damn, walking through the jungle sucks. It's, Do you know how many times in Oregon I've heard the phrase, man, there's some weird motherfuckers wearing weird clothes in the woods? <laughs> Nick, are you part of an untouched tribe? <laughs> no, but there's a there's a lot of weird tribes here in Oregon, you could say. <laughs> oh, ones that have really interesting relationships with horses, that's for sure. No, that's Enumclaw, Washington. Well, okay, Washington, Oregon, I, I always confuse those. But I imagine one out of, I don't know, 20 generations has to at least try. It has to at least try to make it out of the forest and try to find, you know, takes his, take the immediate family, so his wife and kids, and try to venture out and find new land. I mean, our ancestors did it, Why? and we're all related, so... Why would we imagine that's not going to happen the same? So maybe, maybe that's how untouched tribes become back into the species, and it's small because, like you said, Nick, they're not making it to a metropolitan area or Rio Janeiro. They're meeting smaller local tribes, maybe a fishing tribe somewhere along the river, or maybe they decided, you know what, I made this canoe. Let's just keep going down the river as far as we can go, and worst comes to worst, we'll hike back but they come across you know a fishing crew and they talk they trade fish and well they try to talk and they go he goes back to his tribe and goes hey i met all these equal people and they that untouchedness dissipates i feel like that's probably happened quite a few times in history yeah i'm sure that uh i think that's a really good point i mean it's just the odds i'm just i feel like we would have heard about it maybe not well i'll be honest i don't know half what's happening in the world politics today and that's televised politics so hearing about some small fishermen's finding some tribe members that may or may not be untouched because they might not know if they're untouched if you're a tribe and you run into another tribe you might not know that tribe's not untouched maybe you just think they're in between or something might be hard to identify what an untouched tribe is unless we already know that they're an untouched tribe yeah that's true I guess it's not like we have a check mark like, check this box if you're from an uncontacted tribe. <laughs> oh God, man! They Nick, they might be the only people to beat the system of taxes because they're untouched, so they don't have to pay taxes. And that's the dream. That's the dream. Well, on that note, Nick, I don't got much left. Do you have anything to add on? No, I mean, uh, I'm curious what after our discussion. Do you, do you think we do some limited interaction or there's just nothing at all? I guess case by case basis. I'm still torn. I mean, I had, you brought up a lot of points I didn't really think about, but I still don't know where I stand. I think if I had to make a a a, uh, a game plan for myself for the tribes, I would say case by case scenario, but try to start interacting with most of them. Like maybe 25%, like two out of 10 tribes, you don't touch at all. You just observe. But the rest you start bringing in because that way you get the study, but you're still helping a large portion of tribes. So kind of try to play the lesser of two evils, I guess. But that's that's the only game plan I really got is see what the tribe is, see if they're going to go extinct or if they need help and try to figure out a way because eventually one way or the other untouched tri we might be living in the last era of untouched tribes nick that by the end of the 21st century untouched tribes might no longer exist yeah that, i think that's a very true statement before we end this mike what are you reading i am reading why we sleep by matthew walker i just started it and He's got a very interesting writing style, which I kind of appreciate. He kind of writes it, each chapter, as its own standby, so you don't have to follow the order. And what about you, Nick? What are you reading? I'm reading David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell, and it's basically, why do the underdogs win in history so many times? 
Sounds like a good read. It sounds like the underdog finally gets its due. Yep, that might be a perfect book for the uncontacted tribes. <laughs> but Nick, I imagine we've missed a lot of things and a lot of different ideas that we never even discussed. Where could people find us if they want to tell us their ideas and thoughts? You can find us on Instagram and YouTube. You know, leave a comment anywhere. Subscribe. Send us a message. You can comment on the post. DM. Whatever you want to do. Nick just wants you to slide into his DMs. That's all. And Nick, can they find us on Twitter? You cannot find us on Twitter. Why can't they find us on Twitter? I am struggling to come up with anything clever. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Well, Nick, I have probably now more questions than I do answers, but I learned quite a little bit and definitely helped me with my thinking of how to interact with kind of just untouched, uncontacted people, let, let alone whether they're a tribe in the rainforest or a neighbor down the hallway of just trying to find common ground and communicate. It is crazy, my friend. And to all those listening, thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up, so let us know what we forgot. And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on Instagram.